Oh, I was I saying that so. uh, when Rob and I were there for the four shows, I think what we don't realize, even though we didn't get a sketch on in quotes, but being at the rewrite table and being around the office, you can just tell if you're in the game that long like they were, yeah. just by saying we're pitching throwaway jokes in sketches on rewrites, I think just hearing someone talk at lunch or dinner or hearing pitches, mm -hmm. by the end you can go, they've got game or not. Like oh, yeah. they can tell like, just from what I heard, the little bits, we're on the right track with these guys. Cause I'm sure they went to Downey Lauren said, what do you think? Do you want these two clowns back? And then, uh, you know, smile or <laughs> Frank you, and Chirp. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something that's important as well. And that, and especially Lauren, like he wants to hire people he can go to dinner with. Yeah. He wants to hire people that really have a high social IQ in the room, and you two qualify for that. As far as integrating in with everybody, you guys had a lot of charm, and you wouldn't overtalk. You'd insert, you know, and so that yeah. part of the reason you're there, besides your great comedy chops, was just social skills. And Lauren really picks up on that, you know? Yeah. You, you get along well. And I just want to say, I'm going to tear up, but Rob... <laughs> Who wrote Il Cantori? Because that okay, well, was that one was of happened. my favorite oh, moments man. I ever did on the show, and I did not I will write tell you, it. that was influenced by an experience that Adam and I had. Well, we First of all, I went over to, I mean, I, it's a weird thing, but like money, how I equate success, you know, is something like my I parents, do. when they spent money on, on a couch, they bought a new couch, and they immediately covered it in this quality, high, thick polyurethane plastic, and they wouldn't let, when they still wouldn't let us sit on it. Because it's, it's a really nice couch. Oh, you could. So that makes sense. Like, yeah, I got so that. So that was like, you know, we have money for a couch now. <laughs> don't don't fuck it up. <laughs> this never. is our couch. Don't oh, spill yeah. shit never on it. Never sit on it. Don't spill Don't even it. look at it. Use it for guests. And when yeah. the guests come over, and if they're special guests, we'll unzip the plastic. So I'm always, so that's the way I equate, like, you know, you know fame and success as a couch. So I went over to Adam well, Sandler. Well, how do you connect that? <laughs> I, don't, I don't get it yet. Unzipping the plastic. We're getting there. Unzipping. So okay, I went over to an unzipped brand new couch at, 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 at Adam's. I said, he must be making money. This is a new couch. It was like a little couch. And so, and then, so we started, at, you know, by the second season, we're making a little bit of money. So then we take, we had girlfriends too, which is another sign of success. Mm -hmm. One of the yeah. reasons, well, let's be honest, we really got into, wanted to get into show business because I like, you know, when I played trombone and in, in the, the marching band and in high school, I said, this is is not, not going to get dropper. me a supermodel. This yeah. is not going to anywhere close. I said, what is it going to do? What can I do better than this? So, and well, so we will stand for, up. For a second, for the Lonely Hearts Club that I was part of, once you are forced to act confident, stand on a platform yeah. and dominate a room, even if you're just pretending, your stock goes up with, <laughs> with young girls. So it is it is uh, Xanadu. It is I like, like a certain comedian like Norm MacDonald, like, you know, yeah, you got about 45 minutes to close the deal when you're done because, you know, the women, the power, it, it, it depreciates after you're on stage. It's like, Jesus, this guy's like a scientist about getting laid after getting on stage. Well, wow, the power move is at the other cafe where there this girl that you couldn't even talk to in high school is flirting with you and then they're announcing your name. I got to go. Oh, yeah, you know. Oh, you, but anyway, Those go back to your nights. story. Sorry about so that. So, anyways, I'm at Adam Sandler's place. He's got a new couch, and I go, "Well, this is, well we have we've changed, <laughs> nice. and yeah. then we have girlfriends, good looking girlfriends, and all of a sudden, so we go, uh, so we go to a place that we wouldn't have gone the first season because I remember like uh, he lived, he he had um, his dad knew somebody who had like a, so he had like a couple of months for the first time, the first season at SNL, just mm -hmm. in case it's not, you know, wasn't work out above this restaurant on Madison Avenue. And it was a little, little apartment that he mm -hmm. got for like the, you know, for a few months. And I remember the place was so expensive downstairs. It was like a, the turkey sandwich was $17. And he what said, the fuck? I said, we'll split a Jeez. turkey. I said, you and I will said, we'll split a turkey sandwich. Yeah. And then we'll just eat downstairs. And it's one of those fancy places. So you kind of, it's cool mm -hmm. to hang out there. So by the time we started making a little bit of money, yeah. uh, the second season, we take the girlfriends, we go to Little Italy, let's show off a little hey. bit. And these Italian guys <laughs> were kissing this. the girls. There we like, go. Hey, okay, how are you? Oh, that, and they're kissing your girl. And they're kissing your girlfriend. Hey. 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 Your girlfriend, they're kissing hey, her girlfriend in front of you. Yeah, yeah. yes, yeah, so they're kissing, yeah. kissing, kissing up and down. And, 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 and you know, and, and the, the hug also seemed like you know, the hug was also very uh, you know uh, familiar. Yeah. Yes, uh, it was like ah, uh, and they, they just welcome. met them, and we go like, well, you know, we're happy to be here, but it was a little odd. But yeah, so, but add, that sunk in something really to Adam's psyche about that, and um, I remember he went off. Um, and I had a great office on, on the 17th floor that actually you could see the Empire State Building. It's like, nice. this is ridiculous. 
Mm-hmm. This is like, this is yeah, incredible. Yeah, it's all How did incre- I get it's this? It's all incredible. It's amazing. Yeah. So, and then, and just being on the 17th floor and go like, who, did Aykroyd have this office? I was always, yeah, you know, yeah, the yeah, history yeah. of the show. And then, um, uh, so Adam came in with Robert Smigel and they can't, they can't talk. And they're literally like, it's two o'clock, two thirty in the morning. Just I was when, about when to say, good, it's got to be him and Smigel. That's when the 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 the, um, the good stuff starts to come because yeah. the structural side of your brain gets really really tired, and so the goofy tired. side yeah. takes over. Yeah, yeah. and so just, these guys are coming in and they're literally giggling and and just falling over. And they just literally hand me this piece pieces of paper, <laughs> and it was typed at that time, so they yeah. got it typed and then they hand it to me. And they're watching me, and I'm reading the the sketch. Bellissima, where they're the kissing and telling yeah. yeah. Chris and they. Yeah. And they they watch me. Alley. They watch me just to make sure that they weren't just being goofy Crazy. themselves. Yeah. Then they watched me, and I reading it, and I, I fell on the floor, rolling, uh, laughing, mm-hmm. and they said, "We got something here." God damn. And then Adam and I, you know, we know that Dana was gonna murder. Yeah, you, you know, have to bring in the he, big yeah, guns. Yeah, Dana would would have an, another player. level of commitment. Which is like there was a level of commitment you expect this, and then Dana would would just you know would just would go off. But the, it, off it, was, it was pennies from heaven for me because <laughs> you have to write a lot of stuff. But when you get something handed to oh, you, that's a crusher. It's physically funny and in every other way funny. You I almost can't, which, you so can't it's fuck it's it up. A, for people. No. It's a, one of the most famous sketches in our era there, where they the for Italian sure. waiters are kissing and and then you know. You being one of the Italian waiters, you come by and you, you lick uh, Kirstie, Kirstie Alley's face. face. She was a gamer. She, oh, she's what I call a broad. She was great. She I licked that. the shit out of her face. I said, yeah. are you okay with this? She goes, oh, yeah. And so I was like, <laughs> making a meal She knew she was in a fucking crusher she sketch. Was the, she's and, very cool. And then Adam's like, you know, we shared a dressing room for years and- he said, and he looked at me, and he's a you know bit of a hairy guy, and he's he's got one of those those <laughs> ho- hockey legs, you know, like yeah. the northeasterner kind of guy. Yeah, so you know, just like, yeah. He's got a hockey legs. ass, you know. He's yeah, like, yeah. He should yeah. be playing, and yeah. he's actually Chunky. a pretty good skater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he's actually like we during like um, the the second season. There, I remember we we're walking to go to get something to eat, and it was <laughs> it was snow in the street, and he would like run out. And during a stop, when there was a stoplight, and he'd get behind a cab and sneak behind a cab, and he'd let the cab pull him. And, and, and have his, and, just his shoes yeah. on the ice? Just his tennis shoes on the oh, ice. Oh, yeah. And then he would like, oh, and then Papa, he'd bump his shoes on the But he wouldn't, he, he would handle it and be just good skater. Good guy. And I went like, shit. Yeah. And I said, dude, you're famous. You're going to get, you know, you're going to get smashed. He didn't need anything extra going on. He already had everything going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, then, so and then he also can do that. And, and then he asked real. me, he says, so, hey, and he said, um, should I, um, <laughs> should I shave my pubes? And I went, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And I just knew it was going to grow back and he was going to be in agony for a couple of weeks and I was going to enjoy that. And yeah, so I'm, he's <laughs> preparing, he's got this like diaper on before and he just blew Oh, shave the pubes for the and, bit. Yeah, so mm-hmm. he, he's there before, Not we're in the you. dressing room and he said, should I shave my pubes for the Italian waiter's bit? Because he comes out in a diaper basically with, a, with his ass <laughs> hanging out. And I said, absolutely, yeah. Adam. Yeah. Shave yeah. the shit out of that. And then he did and then, um, and I came out and I was ass naked and that was when the, the sensor... Um, who was the time in our era? Andrew Brewer. Andrew Brewer. Said, yes. Please don't show your ass. Please, please, I beg you, I'll get fired. Please, 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 I beg you, beg you. Because then they were laughing so hard, when, especially when you were humping Victoria well, how, Jackson. I want to ask from your point of view about that, because how did we get to that? Where I go as the waiter, I lick Kirsty's face, I do all the yalaba, I go back, and somehow <laughs> Victoria and I are having some debate or something, then I lean her down on the table. <laughs> did I do that in the dress show? No. I did. You didn't. Okay. You, you, what happened was like a lot of times you take something, oh, this is funny. Let's do it more and more. Yeah, yeah. And by the, by the, by the dress rehearsal, it was screamingly funny. Mm-hmm. And then it was another level. And then Farley also was like, was <laughs> humping the window at the end. Yeah. So it was a thing. And then it was one of the, <laughs> I forgot Farley yeah, was in Farley. one of the few sketches. And, and the, the, the biggest tag of any sketch I was ever involved in was usually you don't have a good ending for something. Right. But, but Kevin Nealon, who was the date of Kirstie Alley said, oh, let, let's go to a, hey, this this is too much. Let's go to the, the this is a Greek restaurant down yeah, the street, yeah. <laughs> which is like, oh my God. And it was a screaming laugh at the end. Mm-hmm. I remember being four feet away from you, four mm-hmm. feet away from um, uh, from Adam. And we're looking at each other with that slight little grin. Because I never liked being one of those guys who ever broke. I never yeah, broke. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I just didn't, didn't respect I it. It wasn't broke. part of the tradition of mm-hmm. the SNL. And I know that they did after we left or after my years there. You're not allowed not to lie. But I looked at him and there was yeah. a look on our face like- Holy we couldn't shit. hear each other do our lines. Yeah. But we knew it so well right. that we like, it's just murdering. Like, especially when I came out, it was a scream when I came out because I showed my ass came out. Are you, you, know? yeah. you come out naked? I came but out you naked. you came out so 
centorial and so straight and so no sense your ass is hanging out you're just you're bare and you're just acting so regular it's yes just, that, that was a, that that was something that the audience had never no had, winking seen at it. all yeah it's, yeah which is so good to not comment on yeah it. and just commit to the stuff you know which mm -hmm. was what you need to do but there's a little bit of you're enjoying it also it's always behind the eyes when i have victoria's yeah. legs in the air <laughs> and i'm having a kind of an argument with you guys what about that what are you doing what that? And that's going, and I can't really even hear myself. The audience yeah. is roaring because of the visual of it. Victoria, of course, was such a gamer. Oh, yeah. And that was a perfect part for her. So you guys wrote and produced a perfect sketch, basically. That one was the best one. I mean, th there were some some that were... Um, some just stand some out. Some just like, well, that was... There's just... There are things that are you can't deny. Another thing that, a little gem that the great Dana Carvey gave me, he was, because uh, you're frustrating. You don't know how the business is. I didn't know anyone in it. My mom was a, mm -hmm. was a teacher, war survivor. My dad had his own trauma in, in his uh, in his youth. You know, the, there's a suicide. His father committed suicide. So I was raised with, I didn't know yeah. anything. I had fragile, very fragile parents who were also really, really had a violent streak. To, I don't know what the <laughs> hell I'm doing. And I don't know. And, and But Dana mm -hmm. gave me this thing because you have this fire in you. But it's like, I tell my own kids i said like and i got luckily beautiful little kids and i said you got a fire in you fire is very instructive it can it can it can cook your dinner but it can also burn the house down you know and mm. danny said very instructive to me i never forgot it's one of the things that you, you keep going that shit. what did i say no, exactly? you said <laughs> you don't have to let people know how hungry you are mm -hmm. that was informative because it's like i want this fucking thing so bad and oh, look at these it's like yeah. calm down said and then you said get so good they can't deny you I you still that. may not get the job. Yeah. But yeah. get so good they can't deny it. And then, and then they go, well, yeah, well, that guy's amazing. That guy's great, but we got to hire the more famous guy. And the, that ca yeah. that keeps you going for, for because years. Because club drama. When you're, you're starting out in clubs, a lot of drama, and you can get into the drama with yeah. the dysfunctional comics. I should be a headliner. I don't know why I got that. And just keep, look at your own feet, stay in your I lane, act, yeah. and just become undeniable. But, 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 the, but, who, but yeah. who takes you aside and gives you that kind of information? Yeah, it's nice. And then also the witness to it. Like, I said, well, this, and I said, when I, I we had a great drive down to LA one time, stayed at your apartment, and mm -hmm. I was like, well, this is beautiful. This, this is going to be my future. I'll move down here. <laughs> this is going to be amazing. I <laughs> love it. guys going to LA. I yeah. love it. And they say, and he's like, no, this, and then like, and I remember it's like, uh, you were on that, that TV show where they like, clearly the most you know I said this is the most talented guy I know and they don't know how to use him yeah. and they, they I, let you have five minutes to do whatever you wanted at the end of that TV series which where you played a helicopter pilot oh that yeah and well, I was like Blue Thunder Blue Thunder, Blue Thunder. I, I never should have done that stuff that was my own but that's insecurity. just getting a job you gotta get a like because I was so I they wanted to have me do a TV show I, I did yeah. quit after that I just focused on stand up for the, for the last two years before SNL but it was really informative yeah. too I said yeah. like well if they can't He's the most talented guy I know. Yeah. Most talented guy out of, the, of San Francisco. This this is the guy. And it said like, and if if, if this if, if he's having a problem here, <laughs> yeah. what the hell am I worried about? And that actually was very informative as well. So well, this shit, it's hard. And so that's why when you do a thousand auditions like we did, yeah. you know, and like the thing about what was cool about Spade was he had already done a movie. And that was oh, like amazing. Because right. uh, Police I, Academy. That, that was yeah. like a an enigma in a in a you know. It's crazy. I was already yeah, on set for ten weeks, and, and but you know, Robbie, we got the balls you had was when things were cooking quicker for you. You got offered a movie, and you said no. I think it was the one with Michael J. Fox in New Zealand, yeah, the I Frighteners. And it was also and was like, Peter Jackson. I should have said yes, but the script was I terrible. I think it was 300 Peter grand. Jackson. I was like, it was his first American movie, but it was called Abracadaver, which is like, oh my God, oh. that sounds like a career ender. That's the great, oh yeah. yeah but it wasn't, it wasn't a great, but <laughs> no, like, I would have. <laughs> no, it was, I think 300 grand because I was more torn up by it than you were. I was like, he's turning the fucking book. But you also and, the balls, I also right? did some shitty you ones wrote though Copy too, Machine when we were just being told every day, don't put yourself in two lines. Well, that was the and thing. And then you wrote your own sketch and I was like, the balls. And then it got on and I was like, 
Wait, that's even possible? <laughs> well, that's a dangling carrot. Because uh-huh. like when Lauren hired us. That was us, too good to. Lauren was It's a like, little vague, right? He said like, yeah. well, well, I said, but I want to be a performer. I said, um, we're going to hire you. That'll said, come. Oh, we're going to hire you as a writer. Like we, like a, a group, mm-hmm. but we're going to hire you as a writer. Because <laughs> that's what happened. After I got, I didn't do the, didn't meet with him because I went and do a $75 gig and shit my pants. Like <laughs> San I did Diego. Look, and San Diego. Then I freaked out. And then, uh-huh. then I really got nervous because then they, they flew us back to New York and we had to perform for the writers at yeah. catch. And you know, they didn't laugh once yeah. in the whole time. They just want to see mm. if you, if you're going to get shaken. That's it. Lauren, when I was, he, he pushed me a little bit. Do you have anything else? Or is it just that? I mean, he wow. literally tried to shake me, not at the club. He saw me at a club, but at, at the little audition. So yeah, that, that is a show that rattles when you. you don't give it up. You don't, you don't, you don't. Yeah, but there was a thing about like, remember when the ears burning off my face? I was yeah. saying, I remember at that point I had to say to myself, okay, you just got annihilated physically, emotionally, spiritually, in every yeah. way you can. And I said, you can't, I said, I just said to myself, you cannot let this get to you. And you have to, you have, I said, I'm willing to let them get to me till here. And it was like my belt. Mm-hmm. I said, I'm going to let this affect me here, but not all the way to my feet. I'm not going to let that happen. Not my and dick. so like when I was eating it that night, just get through this, man. Get through this. They saw you be funny yeah. the other day. Just get through it. Get through it. And I walked out of there and I was shaken by it, but not broken. And that was the key because on live mm-hmm. TV, you can't shake. No. You can't be broken. You got to no. stand in there and do it. And it's just the repetitive nature of it and just, just getting steely and getting tough. And then to mm-hmm. the other level, to enjoy it. That's the that's where you want to get to, and that takes took me a little time to truly enjoy it. We, and, you know. and then also to deal with the pressure of it. I mean, because oh. that is a cra- I mean, that's why, like, when we first got there, I remember you and I looking like, what is everybody complaining about? This is the greatest thing ever. Mm-hmm. And like four years later, it's like, boy, it just it does wear you down. Sure, hundred hour weeks. So sure. when you so the, it's like a dream come true when you got copy machine guy. What what was that feeling? Because <laughs> then you get on the show well, when you get and there and you see like wow something's popping. These people hard. get onto restaurants quicker than me. <laughs> like you got Phil yeah. Harp and you got Dana Carvey. You get these murderers row up there. Yeah, and then um, but you also know like I know I can get this, and if I just got to get on there, and then you know then I remember uh, when the first year the late no uh, it was late. Um, in 1990 when Adam Sandler was hired. Hmm. And this is a guy, and it was so cute because his first week was there. We wrote a sketch together. And um, I said, come on, I'll show you how it's done. Like, I know I've been there before shows by then. <laughs> and then um, he, uh, I remember he stayed up all night and his little eyes were puffy. And we wrote this thing for ourselves. And then- Still had the big legs though. Yeah. <laughs> <So go ahead. laughs> I want to picture Adam. And we yeah. wrote it and then uh, uh, they took it away from us and, and then gave it to like, was going to be, uh, I think well, it was Goodman it away, and, and Hartman. John, yeah. And they said like, well, I said, well, what do we have to, in a gentle, gentle way, uh, what do we have to do to, um, to get on ourselves here? And it was very instructive too. He said, when, and it was down, he said, when you could perform something, when you write something that you could perform better than other people, then we'll, we'll get it on. And I said, okay, bingo, I'll come up with something. And I liked writing for other people because I enjoyed also the it's thrill mm-hmm. of like when you performed a piece that was probably the best one I'd ever written for any piece. Mm-hmm. And you had a way of like, you would like, uh, it was like a, the wave, a really great comedian, as opposed to like a sketch player, maybe could do it too, but a comedian in a big room can ride the wave and before it's coming down, you know, three quarters, two quarters, no one to come in with that other line. And it was a massive hairy head wound. Oh, did so you write that? you're kind of the main architect of that sketch. I as wrote well. that. Well, yeah. that with, oh, with, with Adam, but that was me. Well, double double oh, thanks because I, I was writing a rocket in that, wow. and of course, what we, we talk talked about, about in the podcast, the dog thing at the end was. You can't beat a dog going dog. <laughs> you can't. Sketch. But the thing about it was the dog in, the, in, in dress rehearsal. Yes. What did you guys do? With the dog in dress <laughs> rehearsal, we said, Sneaky. okay, uh, well, it, we can't have it rabid, but like it said, they said to us, you know, and I don't know anything about dogs. And they just said, well, if we don't feed it, it's going to, uh, you know, it'll get to do what we want by the time. And anyway, so they didn't, they, they fed it a little bit. So it was curious. It was Curious at, at, dress. At, at dress. And it was absolutely oh, famished. <laughs> Did you put more, was it baby food you put on the pasta? It was liver baby food. Liver baby food. We put on, and, and we I said, on, I fucking put it on. And I just, I just, I caked on, on there. I yeah. tried it. And it you was did good. a beautiful thing where like, cause it was literally ripping off the side of your head, yeah. which was a wig, yes. a prosthetic with a, 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 a I mean, bloody The wound. dog went for it. it basically, a massive hairy wound. It wanted, it wanted it on air. It wanted it. Massive hairy head wound was a guy who should not be at a party. 
who's at a party and just with a big head wound yeah, yeah. and it's just you know is getting everybody is just like he's trying to normalize it which is great somebody a crazy person sweet, in a room uh, yeah. yeah in a situation where yeah, you never be trying to treat you normally and, right? and, and, and then he's got this reacting. <laughs> giant head wound they're reacting and he's this is a punch bowl and there's a thing and then at the end there's um, I take a nap take a nap and the dog goes later, yeah. to town and it was a one of those things where you're watching it and it's just it's going really good and you're just like oh god come on please get, keep going keep, keep going, going. Get, yeah, to this, get to this get to this and then when the dog literally went I mean just really went, went for it went to get it went yeah. to get it because it knew where it was yeah. and was hungry mm -hmm. and then you do this beautiful thing where you snuck your hand up on the other side to yeah. hang on to, to hold it and I was in a death <laughs> you were struggle holding, with and you that were also, dog because there was like your eye your eyeball your literally your right eye <laughs> was is stretching is literally <laughs> well, you were like four inches away from this very hungry mm -hmm. dog mm -hmm. and you just kind of rode it rode it and then you had the the wherewithal to remember to let the audience can, can, as it as, as that screaming laugh was coming down to throw in that like <laughs> yeah he I smells think my he dog smells line. my dog I think he smells, must smell my dog yeah, yeah, yeah. but you had to you yeah. had to almost yell it yeah I had to kind of yell it I think he and the thing was is back to our generation of not breaking I, the sketch went so beautifully <laughs> I did not want it to be about the prosthetic coming yeah. off. Yeah. So by consequence, the the battle extended <laughs> so long that, and I heard someone, Lauren watching the monitor, which always, we always want to make Lauren helpless. Yeah. And he was helpless with laughter. But he anyway, laughing, Robbie, yeah. I, God, what can no. I do for you? I mean, those are <laughs> you two- You did, it's the least I could do to pay you why back for all you did for me. Two great gifts. When you do- we, Rob and I both had this problem where, we, you know, you're writing that first year, even second year for me, and you're putting your stuff in even smaller parts, and they go, give that to Dana, give it to Mike Myers, give it to, and you have to keep taking yourself out. So the one way in is update, because you're by yourself, you can try to get something on. That was Sandler's like, key, was the Sam Eddie Murphy route. Especially the guitar you got and your there. Yeah. And your copy machine, but I think the host was Sting the first time you did it. Well, the first time I did it was with um, Joe- uh, Pesci? No, 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 Joe. Uh, Mantegna. Mantegna. Mm. And I remember it was so crushed because I finally had a monster. It was one of the things I said when, when um, because uh, Jim Downey notices a kind of like a goofy, too happy to be here kind of attitude, you know, was this. And, um, <laughs> and he said, you got to do a character called the Lurker. It kind of got this hanging around. But the, it, truthfully, <laughs> and I gave him credit, but they truthfully, the copy machine yeah. guy had nothing to do with that, really. Mm -hmm. It was it was just a guy, what the truth of the, the real um, that really came from when we first got there to SNL. Mm -hmm. Remember before we got the really good office? Mm -hmm. They gave you, there were so many cast members, I think right. 17 at the time. That, we the first there. time a really big cast. There was a yeah. giant cast where literally the crawl of the show was actually longer than like the monologue. Yeah. Because it was like, like 17. And yeah. also, and this, and Coast Air, and, <laughs> and the feature player. It was like <laughs> Ellen Cleghorn, and David <laughs> and Ross Schneider, and Adam Sandler. Like, it went on, and Melanie Hustle. And, yeah. um, so it, <laughs> it would go, so we were in like a half of a half an off. Yeah. And so I had the cooling and heating vent in mine. So it was either boiling or freezing in there. So I, and I have claustrophobia because I have two older brothers and put me in sleeping bags and closets my childhood. So like I, I, I can't stand in closed place. I hate it. And so I would go out into the, into the main writer's room. And I noticed when everyone's walking back and forth, you can't be as excited the fourth and fifth time mm -hmm. when you see, you know, Kevin Nealon. So Kevin right. was the one I said, Kevin, all right, Kevin, right. Kevin. Just your doors open. And yeah. he came and played with the idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what do you want, buddy? What's uh, Kevin, you know? And that was it. It was It was like, and I said, you ha I had to come up, and then I was went to New Orleans for the weekend uh, just to you know, take off some pressure. And I thought, like, well, there's got to be a reason why people would come into contact with this annoying person. And they didn't want to put him somewhere else. And I just can't, I said, well, oh, copy machine. Copies. That was it. Simple, but but I remember, like, people were laughing so hard at read-through, which was like, to mm -hmm. me, the, the real, mm -hmm. the, to me, the real, democ you know, for, there's, there's no such thing as a democracy in, in, in show business but that was the most democratic thing i've ever experienced yeah. if you wrote a sketch it was read in front of everybody right. and you, that is pretty damn amazing so if you yeah. murdered with everybody and chances usually are usually that's good and i i think that uh i would use the word inexplicability like making copies it's all not a punchline <laughs> yeah. you know it's all the absurdity and the rhythm to it but it's also just kind of a a nerd in an office leaning back 
trying to be friendly. I mean, it works on a lot of levels. And he has Did a you big, comb your hair smile. up in kind of a funny way? Or I always had my hair big by that time because it, it was, was just like, like Elvisy, yeah, yeah. Elvisy. And he's like, he was a guy that you also he kind of kind of gentle and nobody wanted yes. to hurt his feelings, yeah. but he's also annoying. And so it was a nice combination of uh, this vulnerability, smiling, yeah, too. vulnerability like, is a like big one, yeah. And, yeah. and then people, and I remember, uh, I remember that like because I did it with with Joe Montana, and they said we're gonna we're gonna cut it save for it? time, we're gonna save it, oh. and I went like oh. save it. Terrifying. It's, it's, been, it's my chance. I'm, I've waited all these years. I'm 25. <laughs> oh, yeah. I got to make it now. And who's this guy? But the guy who ball? wants to make it guy? Or it? <laughs> but how would you not it. give yeah. it to the host? I mean, every the, always the trick is if you write some of the host, that's the best Usually, shot. They knew that. Well, the, if you could perform it better, that yeah. sing songiness mm -hmm. to it. Yeah, I mean, man, the rhythm I don't know if it's a perfect guy for that. Right. So when did it first kill? Who was the host? Sting. 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 Well, yeah, he's got came out of the gate. Yeah. And people got into the rhythm early into that sketch. When was the first line? Third line. Third time? The third line, Kevin, and they said, hey, what's going on? It's like, all right, Kevin, asking me questions. Kevinator, Kevin, and that yeah. one. Oh, they laughed. The second one, Kevin. Kevin. Yeah. You know, just yeah. there's no new information happening. Mm -hmm. was but he's continuing the conversation. Like, dun, 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 well, like dun, Sting looked dun, like dun, a fucking yeah, star. Right. Yeah, that's it exactly is. That's right. like yeah. a little song, and then <laughs> there you can laugh. And then they found yeah. a spot for it. And then I remember, uh, you know, the great Jim Downey, Took me aside and said, uh, "Well, it's the only time like they hadn't done it very often in that show. Where like, you know, except for you know mm -hmm. the you know the your the weight of you having to open every show for years mm -hmm. was they said we're going to do um, we're going to do another one of those. They said we have a very very uh, rare thing here, a character that uh, that people love." And I said, it was a very rare, very, the rarest of things here. And I said, we're going to do another one. And then he had the idea of the copy machine breaking down. And that was the best one we ever did. Oh, I remember. And that was phenomenal. That was like, because he got to see his whole world crushed, oh. crushed, you know, the copy and what, machine. How got, does he react to that? Oh, what, he what is it? It's like, well, they, they're taking the machine out. Yeah. There's no reason for him so to then no one to have contact losing. with him anymore. His world is <laughs> yeah. taken apart. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> what it's is really, he, so what does he say? <laughs> You're yeah, sad. You know, it's just, he just got crushed. Black and then, and then they, um, and they brought it back in, but you got to see him just like <laughs> devastated. Yeah, yeah. And I just remember laughing. But when the first time we did it, the read through, J Jim was dying laughing because of the rhythm. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. a rhythm of a rhythm of a rhythm. Yeah. And and that by the time it was like, and there was just a a pummeling of it, mm -hmm. and he was dying laughing. And it's great okay, to make Jim laugh. Yeah. This is the one that's going to yeah. get on. And Jim would give it up. That was the key to it. He was interested in us as young guys, and I think fed off the energy. But also, if he found something funny, he was very generous. You know, and that wasn't always the case with people. You know, because you know. Like, you know, Jay Leno was like, was another influence. Like when Bob Fisher mm -hmm. was a manager, he said, and I was a young comedian. He said, uh, you're going to pick up Jay Leno. He's got a gig in San Jose. You're going to take him to the radio. And I know, you know, San Francisco, you're, you grew up here. You're going to, you know, like the back of your hand, take him wherever he wants to go. So Jay Leno, which is a great Jay Leno story. I, that, that's, that's an old one. You got to hear this one. But so I pick up Jay, just have Jay's, a sign. Jay's very wise. Nice, clean car. Yeah. And so, um. Uh, you know, he, he picked him and said, hey, you, see, you, you, you drive me to the gang. Yeah. I said, yeah, okay. I mean, you know. So we're driving, and I'm not saying anything. I'm just driving mm -hmm. there. And mm -hmm. um, he said, you know what good um, you know, good Chinese restaurant? Thing? I said, I know the best, Mr. Leno. So I took him to the, the place that my dad knew was like for wealthy people where they would go. We would go to a different place. He said, just as good food, not as expensive, just as good as that place. So I took him to that place, you know. And he said, well, come on and eat. I don't eat my, by myself, you know. And because I wasn't going to go and sit with him, but he yeah. did. And he said, so what are you, a comedian? And I said, uh, Yes. I said, well, how much, how, much, how much time you have? I said, I got about eight minutes. He said, good. You know, most comedians ask how much time. I got two hours. I got two hours. <laughs> Who yeah. wants to hear two hours of comedy material? You either have, you either have five minutes of kills every time, everywhere, everywhere you go, any place, and, oh, you don't have anything. He's right. That's what you got to get. That's and true. so he said, working. So I spent the next six months just only trying to get that killer five, and that was really mm -hmm. helpful. But the Jay Leno story, which is really funny, around that time, he was doing this bit. On uh, on Letterman Co. When, is it, what, what's your beef, Jay? Let me tell you my beef. Let me tell you the beef. And he would do this <laughs> yep. bit, and it was a monster. You know, yeah. like you it and I huge. opened for him. Yes, I've in 1985. For the two of us. Both of us. Okay. Because I did open for him a few you times. Opened for, I was yeah. the opening act. You would come in and you did the you did a half and then he did an hour. Oh, okay. And we yeah. both sat back and went like, wow, this guy, just he's got, it was, we have our killer bits. This guy has every bit is a killer bit. Yes. Yeah. That's what we said yeah. to each other we were watching. It was at the, um, what, the, the Palace of Fine Palace Arts. Palace of Fine Arts. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and he was, was like a professional 
comedian in the sense that every bit would flow to the next bit and Crafted. he was tagging his McDonald's hey a McDonald's trainee how do you be a McDonald's trainee let me get the milkshake for you, you know and it was all killing and it was like hey, yeah. you got the, I had that Buick 1955 Buick you know the kind of car you run into a toy he just holds it off you yeah. run into it and he holds it off and then you go keep driving yeah, and yeah, he's yeah. smoking a pipe backstage and I got off maybe before a he went pipe. off he always had a pipe Hilarious. for the early days and goes uh, hey you need more jokes Mr. Carby <laughs> he was kind of right because I'm just doing jumping broccoli chopping broccoli so i assume jay would be like you know yeah any more jokes you know so, <laughs> but he, he right. and he rode a motorcycle onto the stage you bought broccoli. yeah he always was on a motorcycle motorcycle onto the stage you bought but broccoli that's there's it. a funny thing that happened though <laughs> there was a comedian who did an impression of jay early because we can all do yeah. we're all i'm like you third generation jay leno yeah. we all got that you know it's, yeah. it's like you know um once somebody breaks it and then you yeah, can yeah, figure out how to do it everybody has it so there was a guy who did a, 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 an early impression of uh of jay and he what he would did back then remember there's like a comedy magazine or a comedy list of when your mm -hmm. spots would you you know yeah. so if you had if you were you know like jay leno or jerry seinfeld you could buy a whole page which is like you know just for laughs newspaper yeah so you can and then yeah. it would promote and it would yeah. hand it out to the yeah. different comic book say so, you know and he's playing this auditorium yeah, Civic Center, that. and like, jerry was another comic. one way ahead of us it, yeah, yeah and like they were pretty promoting and big mm -hmm. you know whatever and so but what happened was there was a comedian who saw where jay was playing so he would call up and say yeah, he says, yeah, 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 you're gonna, I'm doing my your gig, and then, then, you know, it's, it's kind of one thing though. When I show up at the airport, you're gonna have to have uh, 25,000 in cash at the airport when you pick me up. And so Jay would fly to this place and they go, uh, Jay, uh, here, uh, thanks for coming, and here's your the, here's the cash. You go, what, 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 what's this? He said, it's uh, 25,000 you asked for. I didn't ask for 25,000. What are you talking about? Who answered? I'm not. And it's like, and he said, and then, and then he would go to another place, you know, and the guy would call ahead and say, Listen, yeah, he says, yeah, yeah, before I need to, um, oh my God, that's you're gonna have cool. a, uh, I need the 25,000 so in, in a brown, in a brown paper bag, and you have it at the airport. You gotta do it, or I'm not gonna do the gig. And so the guy would show up, hey, Jay, here's 25,000. What is this? 25,000. What's 25,000? Yes, Jay, you, you asked her, you know, 25,000 brown paper bag. It's like, I didn't ask, what the hell's going on here? Let me tell you what you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Japanese so, cars. I gotta go down here. And so what he did was, he called, he finally figured out what was going on here. So he called and said, listen, if you get the guy, uh, he calls up and says, it's me. Just get his number. And then they, he got his number, this comedian. Uh-oh. Who's doing it? And then he found out the guy's name. And when he, and the, the, the best part of the story, he was going to, uh, he was auditioning for Jim McCauley for The Tonight Show. Mm, he said, oh let me, let me know when, he, when, he, when he's going on. So before uh, they bring him up, <laughs> Jay said, let me just go up and do some time. So oh, Jay goes up, here comes Jay. does 45 minutes of his killer shit at the Comedy Magic Club before this guy goes on mm -hmm. and blows out the room. Yeah. Yep. And Jay could blow out any sure. room he wanted and blew it out till there's just nothing left. And then this guy went on after and just ate it, and didn't get the show. Wow. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm, I'm plead guilty in 78 after Mork and Mindy, I did a couple, you know, her list is rubbing. I need, I need a million dollars cash at the next one. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it to Dana Carvey's house. <laughs> I, think you can, <laughs> I, need, I need a million dollars. Her? I just want to yeah, mention a few these names before we get of our up. pals, and you can join in because they're listening to this from the old San Francisco. That, of course, the great Bobby Slayton, Mike Pritchard, yep. Jake Johansson, yep. Milt Abel, Larry Bubbles wow. Brown, Mark Pitta, yep. Bob Sarlop, Mark McCollum, wow. and many, many more. That came up in that early scene with us. Let me and see that list. And, and, that. and Let Robin, me see this Robin list. Williams was the godfather Robin of that Williams scene. Robin Williams was such, I mean, before the internet, before, you know, cell phones, Robin would show up at like the, at the Holy City Zoo and then people on the street would hear about it. And the next mm -hmm. thing you know, it's packed. The people would be running to get in there. Yeah, and sure. then he'd do an hour at least. Oh, yeah. And then, he, and then he'd leave. And if the drunk people stayed, then we'd have an audience. And so more mm -hmm. times than not, they would be, the audience would come yeah. to see him. And, uh, it was great for and us, hopefully yeah. he'd show up. And more times than not, he did because yeah. he was just, just addicted to it and then mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. loved it. And so we had a scene thanks to him. There was like at one point comedy scene on one street on one block. There were three places to do stand up. Yeah. Was that last day saloon? Had it on like Mondays, or whatever. Clement. Holy City Zoo, yeah. Clement Street, mm -hmm. and Ew. Sixth and Sixth Cops and Clement. In, and then there was a place across the street that would do it on on like Tuesdays. Yeah, a bar. You yeah, know, we were there pre clubs. The clubs the first club got built in seventy nine. Proper club that was the punchline. The punchline that was like a real, punch when you did that, that they paid you twenty five dollars a little bit more that than was, that. That was amazing. But that but like and also just seeing like. Um, 
you know, um, you know, there's a, a well, Sarlot. Sarlot had like a real job in show business. Bob Sarlot. He, he was like on TV, which is like was incredible. You entertainment tonight. He was a sidekick for Letterman on Letterman's morning on show. On the morning show. That was like yeah. ridiculous. And but he had like would do spots on TV and was always smooth and yeah. a totally professional guy. Yeah, great. Kind of like comment. had that that kind of uh, the charisma of like a Leno who yeah. just would just settle in. The audience could be totally relaxed watching him. And then um see like Slayton would murder and do yeah. really edgy Bobby edgy, edgy material that like yeah, I and get away with it and just get to the point where the audience is is pushing back because but then yeah. and dance around it and 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 make jokes off uh, not apologizing for it. Yeah. And that was a really like very instructive way. And he would destroy a room. Like yeah. literally like in the, that I said, that, well, you have to learn what like a headliner is. You had to learn what an MC is, what like a middle act. And you see like you see Dana Carvey is like, well, that's a superstar. But then you see like <laughs> you see Bobby Slate. Solid headliners. Bobby Slate was a solid headliner is gonna work everywhere. And that's yeah. what you gotta do. Yeah, but right. that wasn't my style, because my style was more off standing and uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Some of those so I was good over for twenty. Yeah. My, I would be good for 10, 15, 20. Was interesting and different. Bring the audience to me. And but that's not a headliner. Headliner, you gotta go out and you gotta pummel and that's different. Yeah. But in the uh, last fifteen years, when you've come back to stand up, you've done several specials, you've done great you know that that you then you have great, to, great stand up. You have to change and yeah. adapt because you also have to adapt to what their expectations are. Yeah, when they, you're famous, they see you, you're famous, copy machine, you know, whatever. They, they've seen your and movies, and also all the movies. Let's yeah. see, we mentioned them quickly. I was going to say, if we're going to wrap up, Precious uh, San Francisco, you also <laughs> did um, <laughs> SF Larry Larry Arizona Brown, didn't get much up playing this Larry one. Bubbles Brown, S these guys didn't move to L.A. That was the problem. Yeah, yeah, and they became San Francisco treats. You know, like famous. San Francisco yeah, comics know him. But you yeah. have to make yeah, the sacrifice and come down and eat shit for a while and audition for a thousand. But a lot of people's like, they didn't want to mess with how no. comfortable things were. I never understood that. Uh, like yeah. making that your thing. Because I think it was Rick Overton who said, uh, hey, the cameras are down there, buddy. <laughs> you know, <that's> funny. <laughs> Let's go to where the cameras are. Yeah. You, know? you have to. Rich yeah. Scheidner. Hey, did it say, it says here you dated Julia Sweeney. I don't remember that. No. Okay. I don't know why they did that stuff. Like, like it's on the, it's like that I would says, never. You had a phrase called, you can do it. Is that true? Well, the, that was, <laughs> I, I didn't understand that. Adam asked me to be in one of his early <laughs> movies. He asked me to be in like the, to play the part that Ben Stiller did in um, Happy Gilmore. And it's oh, like, yeah. because of this playing you this You and Adam have a, a chemistry and David, yeah. you guys are part of yeah. that world. Th there was a thing him. where like, there was a comfort level where like, and I finally told Adam, he said, listen, I said, stop. He said, you got to put other famous people in these movies. You don't need, and I said, you, you don't need to hire me for that. I'm telling you, you could hire other, hire Nick Nolte. And he yeah. finally did. And now oh, he's man. not hiring me. He took me up on it. But the, <laughs> but like hire Total people ball. and do these other, you know, and, um, but. But you beat the shit out of that. That's what I mean, doing a great thing well, with that phrase. A rhythm. So uh -huh. the thing was, he said, there's one line and you could do it. And it's, and uh, you can do it? it. And it was, it was actually Hurley who came up with uh -huh. it. And he, and I said, well, what does it mean? He said, just come out we'll figure it out it's a rhythm thing and i'll go like all right so we went out and it was a sing-songy thing of just just a guy showing up yeah who would so yeah. there's that yeah. the fun of the audience knowing that there's some back there's history with that yeah, something's happening in the, in the movie and it was and like and i said i'll find a way to do it and just do it in different ways and like, you can do it <laughs> so it was like a, it was just goofy it, it didn't make sense it was a guy who is not it was inexplicable that's why yeah. it lasts inexplicable it, it, jokes like chopping broccoli or you can do it just like, go on for decades it, it doesn't it's a because it, read. it's it's yeah. something that it doesn't need it to be performed that way. It doesn't. No one in the history of the world would say it that yeah, way. Yeah. It's not necessary. It's unnecessary. It's necessary. Who, say it, who say is? It. It's five <laughs> questions. Who is that guy? What is he doing there? How did he get there? What? When did he come with his catchphrase? Why is he yelling it? When you can get to five questions, that's a keeper. And auditions, I mean, yelling a celebrity, yelling a shit joke. Yeah. Robbie, you can, what's the shit joke? The joke is like, I got chunks of guys like you in my stool. Oh, there you go. Oh, yeah. Phil, Phil Hartman. The yeah, three. Yeah. Three. But the five, yeah. that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. So that was like, and let's do it in different ways. And he kept, mm -hmm. Adam had a genius thing of like, he would keep the audience, they'd always get a laugh in there. And even when it was like a serious part and like the water boy, when he's upset and he throws a, a basket, uh, throws a baseball out the window and it hits the Kentucky Fried Chicken Colonel. <laughs> and he got a laugh and carried them out of that scene. Yeah. So he really knew how to, you know, get keep the laughs going in keep there. Keep going. Absolutely. Pummeling but if you it. go into auditions and then like when we were doing movies and you would have people come in for auditions when you're on the other side of it, mm -hmm. we're casting people. Yeah. And when everyone does a line the same way and then someone does, you can do it, you go, oh. And then you go, have them come back. <laughs> because that stands out. If yeah. you could yeah. if you're not gonna give it the most perfect reading that everyone's gonna give, 
there's something to that. You got to bring something to it. Yeah, that's you bring not something on the page. different. Yeah, bring something on the page. Comedy like when we is did the surprise. wrong Missy. Wrong. There was nothing in that. I mean, truthful, there's nothing in that role in wrong, wrong Missy. Wrong Missy for you. Nothing. But yeah. like, even Adam called me and said, nah, "I don't want you. this this role, but it's not big enough. You don't need to do it. It's there's nothing." Oh, no, what was you the character helped. that in, in Wrong Missy? He, he asked me. That was funny. He asked me to like to do this thing, and, and then he called me up at the last minute and go like, "We really want you to do this." And I said, "Okay, yeah. I'll do it." And uh, I said, "But it's my wife's birthday." He said, "Ah, just just." Bring her. And so we, so we ended up, my wife came and she was happy to, to go to Hawaii. And it was a fun gig because oh I'm just God. showing up doing a small role yeah. at but a small you, time. You always score with my Everyone's role. happy to have you there because yeah. Yeah. you're just coming you were to helping score. Out. Yeah, yes. you were scoring. And, then, and I said, well, let me figure this out. And I called Stanley. I said, what if I do it as an Aussie guy? And I, you know, you're going to go like that. And he said, no. And you know when Adam is like, no. <laughs> what are you yeah. doing? You know, just do it. You know, he's already. He was, just he was, fucking do it. He was stretching. <laughs> just do it. I'm like, God, just do it. Yeah, all right, all right, all right. We love you, Adam. And so, but then you got to find the thing. And I said, well, well, I said, if you start crazier to beginning in the beginning of the scene, and then you got a place to really go. If you were crazy, and I said, "Give me sunburned and never," and I was yeah. like mm-hmm. overweight and burned right. and fat and bald, and I said, "This is going to be great." Snyder and, always commits to yeah. shit. Yeah. And, said, and they gave great. me a hand that was missing a few fingers, and I said, yeah, "That's right." And a the young director, and young directors, you know, you, you be gentle with the young directors, but you also have to like you can't listen a hundred percent because they, you know, if you no. went thirty movies in, you go, "I really think this is a better idea." Then because he said, "Like yeah. when you see that shark down there, you tell him," you know, and and he's like, "You tell him, I'm gonna." Okay, I'm gonna carry you know the attitude is to be angry and I thought well let's do the opposite of that you know and I said oh, come just on. put the camera on yeah, <laughs> yeah, let's I mean, they, yeah keep so it a I nice said, shot I said well, look, when you see that shark down there you tell him what's up <laughs> As if he's like happy to see him again, even though he ate my hand. Yeah. And it's, it's just funnier. And it's, it's, a, it's a rhythm that you don't expect. It's yeah. positive. It's always good to go there if you can. <laughs> and it's, when the guys get eaten by a shark, I said, you got to cut back up to us dancing. Mm-hmm. That was a disco great one. song. And yeah. so you just got to do it. And he said, but we don't have time. I was the and guy I said, just give me one right take. There. I said he's under. David's under the. David's in the. <laughs> and what in the does shark the character tank sound like on the again? boat? I want to hear him. And I said, and he said, we don't have music. We don't have time for the money. We don't have music. And I said, let me talk to my music guy, and I'll give you a piece in thirty minutes. That'll be free. Just uh, yeah, that'll be. So I called my. That's awesome. I called my composer John Hunter in in, in Austin. I said, dude, can you just give me fame? I'm doing this movie. It's Happy Madison. and David Spade's the star. I'm doing, we just need a, a disco song that they they can just have for yeah, free. You Farley Swartz and just are dancing and, and <laughs> playing against me getting eaten by sharks. Yes, and he said, well, we only have time for one take. I said, I'll take it. Yeah, take anything. So he did the one th- with the crane coming up while we're dancing to this disco song while you were underneath the water. And he said, it's something to cut to. You're going to yeah. want it. Yeah. If we don't have time, just do it. So we got one. Yeah. And that's what they use. So that's it what you kind of hope for. Well, we're the- But when- what voice did you settle on? I just, I saw I the movie. They just, wouldn't let me do a, um, sorry, what I ended up doing was like a really low Robert Shaw. kind of guy. Well, they, they didn't want to do Robert Shaw. Shaw it, you know, what I, 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 I wanted to do is a guy who's uh, an alcoholic and great, you know, gravelly voice mm-hmm. and uh, low to b- the opposite of you. <laughs> yeah. Because that was interesting. And That's then like, good. and then you get like, and I had nothing really there. So you just create, so what do I got? I said, I'm, I'm the diving star. Okay, this is my boat. Give me, this is my fucking boat. I'm in charge of the boat. I said, give me some stuff. And the prop guy said, what do you need? I said, give me the, give me the, the snorkel and yeah, the, the respirator. Yeah, so does it need to work? Said, of course it needs to work. Give me the goddamn thing. <laughs> and he said, please turn it around. Give me something to do. And so I started playing with it while between takes. It was funny. And <laughs> it was making noise. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And funny noise. noise. <laughs> yeah. And so we just, and David so and I were working together. Yeah. Part so of the rhythm. It's like a vape we, pen. We were rhythm. fucking laughing. <laughs> yeah. Right? So it's, and so yeah. I, I got this thing, and all of a sudden, <laughs> back and, and I go back. And so, and, what, yeah. and he's about to get into the water, and as he's walking, I'm walking with him with this thing. It's, <laughs> yeah. and I put it, and it's so right before I, pss, pss, I'm, spra- I'm pss, putting it on him and spraying it <laughs> the water, and then I put it in my mouth, and, and then I hand it to him. So you got everything. <laughs> and yeah. David, it's like, I'm now supposed to put that in my mouth. Yeah, and, yeah. David oh, that. Yeah. and I knew yeah. he'd go with it. Yeah, I, yeah, I remember, remember we were rehearsing <laughs> that, and I go, Rob, because it was so funny, I go, do it more. And so, yeah, you were going like, shh, 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 shh. Lick, lick, shh, shh, and I'm just staring at you, and then you finally go, and then you stick it, and you go, and then I put that in my mouth. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but that right. got us out of that scene. Yeah, it was Big so laugh funny. to get to Great. the next funny scene. with the sound off. Yeah. You know, just it that's so all weird. funny, and, and yeah. did it do eight? Funny with eight, the sound off. 100 
billion minutes or how many 55 minutes? 55 million views that first month. And then uh, pff, still Christ. top 10 like, oh, in like history. Minutes, so like a billion minutes I don't know. Back then it wasn't minutes. It was <laughs> oh, just. Okay. But that was the thing. You know, smash. Funny with the sound turned off. Yes. We had an acting coach, Ivana Chubb. Yeah, her, she really credit. helped. That's huge. Roy London was the first one. And then when he passed away, we, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Ivana Chubb took over. And she would say, do the scene again, but without the words. So everyone knows from your physicality what's mm-hmm. happening. Yeah. Because that you're communicating with your body, aren't you? Yeah. You should be. That's I Love and, Lucy. Yeah. That's the great She would also tell us, use a lot of props. Yeah. Really work the room. Like, it's more fun if you're doing business get and you're doing that. And that's hard to do because you're acting. You got to remember your lines. You got you to match but everything. But get it. Get but the stuff. Great. And like for Deuce Bigelow, the thing about that was like- Deuce Bigelow. My <laughs> favorite thing about that, I was flying to Australia to promote the movie. And I'd never flown anybody to promote anything. Mm-hmm. So this is like a, and this is like the first starring role in any movie ever where I was like the guy on the poster. It's like, it's cool to be on the poster and there's a billboard of you. Yeah. And it was- yeah. Um, yeah. And I thought, wait, let's just have a big name. It was Walt, Walt Disney Company did it. And, uh, and it was um, which for Joe Roth. And I said, this is a funnier thing. It's like me naked on the side of a bus, you know, like the Burt Reynolds thing. And I was in really good shape back then. I said, this would be funny. And I said, no. And they said, very interesting thing. I said, posters are to not lose people. Don't give people a reason to not want to oh, go see wow. it. Give a mini, yeah, edge on And I that. said, holy yeah. crap. And so I'm flying to uh, Australia because the movie did really good in America, you know, and then... Um, I just, there's, you you hear this laughter. It's hard to hear anything on a plane, mm. but you hear this booming laughter on a plane. And I go back there and they were watching my movie without the sound. Because oh, really? they didn't want to, you had to spend money to get movies back then. Oh, really wow. good sign. Yes. Really good I sign. I said, this is going to do really good everywhere. Yeah. Because they, but they didn't pay the 10 bucks. They're just watching the movie because they can understand funny. it by the physicality because that's the way you're And you can laugh harder when it's funny with the sound off. You're not waiting for punchlines. It's yeah. just You can just relax. And I know. and sometimes when you're doing things and they don't, you, it's really funny. And then they could ruin it with sound. There was oh, a yeah. Men Behaving Badly TV series. The funniest thing I did in the whole series was very frustrating because the English show was so funny. It's the only reason I agreed to do it. A and they said, just do the same the thing. Yeah. A sitcom on- NBC mm-hmm. and uh, and they just they, they instead of making it just doing the same um, episodes that they did in England they watered them down as like men apologizing badly but there was one really funny thing where they said there was I'm gonna get attacked by an owl and it was in the way back and they're foreground and I'm just in the, in the in the background while there's people in the front which is that's hilarious because yeah. you could be the funny mm-hmm. they said well what do we have we, don't, we can't have a real owl and I said just get a stuffed owl just get something and I'll, I'll pretend it's attacking it. to me yeah. Yeah. so I grabbed the beak right here and I, I did this and I'm spinning around and I'm going out of frame coming back in coming through mm-hmm. I'm hitting it hitting it hit and then and so and that was the um, and then they put and it was it was the funniest thing I had done on that show and then they put like when they when they came on the air the cowardly producers decided to put a squawk, 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 which killed it. Yeah. That because it, it brought too much attention to it. Yeah. But I ended up redoing that for another movie, basically that idea of the far background and yeah. going back with an animal. That's the essence of, of, of comedian trying to be in movies and wanting to control the rhythm. And Sandler told me early on after his success, he goes, Carvey, they don't. Meaning the directors. He did a couple of movies where what Adam didn't get to be Adam. He goes, yeah. they don't know what they're doing, Carvey. Yeah. They don't really know. It's not their fault. They don't know where to put the camera or whatever. So that 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 kind of triggers me a little bit because Scares I had experiences me. just like that. Because that's a survival like, mechanism. You yeah. know what? Yeah. You got to be. Yeah, we know the funny part. Just let us do that. So and you know. and then and then if you get anybody who's going to be a director, and they usually put us with commercial directors because mm-hmm. they know where to put the camera, know how to work, and they know mm-hmm. a schedule and blah blah blah. No, quick, but yeah. they but they also have the ego of like, no, let's do it my way. Right. Yeah. And then you go, but this is what I, I wrote. Well, Penelope Spheres in Wayne's World 1 was my best director because I'd have a Garth thing and she'd go, what are you going to do here? And I'd show yeah. her. And her only direction was, could you do it 10 seconds faster? That was it. No other direction. But Just, that's actually good because I yeah, will say- Yeah, because I already had the character. Of, I mean, you know, and, and the thing is about doing it faster and get, cutting out the pauses yeah, is, that's, is instructive. That's, that's fine. I, you know, that's just, okay, I can do it a little shorter. I, I used yeah. to hate when like- um, you know, Dennis Dugan would say, can you do it without the pauses? Can you just do it without the pauses? Just do it tighter there without the pauses. And I said, can't you just cut it that way? And, and he said, what if I don't want to cut it? And then, then uh, he's right. Yeah, because a single shot is best, ideally, unless the edit is a comic. Well, a that was point. the thing, like John Cleese, uh, such a my hero and like- um, Genius. 
genius. And um, he said, you know, um, look at the scene um, <laughs> in uh, Life of Brian, also voted as the number one comedy of all time in England. Uh, not that, you know, movie. you bastardize our language, but uh, but for, for English, in the traditional. Anyway, it's all, uh, and he said, this is the number one, this is the voted, not by me, of course, but by people who, you know, <laughs> the public. So anyway, so he said, look at the scene when Michael Palin and the, the guards are going in to, um, you know, this is, don't, this is, don't let anyone in, blah, 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 and, and, unless it's him. I don't really know, and it's the guards, and they said, and then, so, okay, let anyone in. No, 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 no. Don't let anyone in, no matter what. And, and it's a very mm-hmm. intricate thing, yeah. but it's a single master shot. Yeah. And it, said, it requires a lot more rehearsal, but it's worth it. They all, let the audience decide where it. they want to look. Because so much of direction, in television direction, and we're in an era of television. Digital it, cutting. Cut, much. Just cut here, let them forth, look at this. Forth, cut here, look at them. Do yeah. this movie. I, I don't really speak Spanish that well but i just directed a film in in mexico and the the editor who's a great guy but he cuts to this and then punch in on this and i said let the audience figure it out and two shots are great where they're looking let the audience decide who they want to look at i feel like when i'm watching some stand-up specials i'm in an invisible flying chair like i'm in a i'm flying in the chair seeing the guy waist up and all of a sudden i'm way in the back and then i'm right up on his face and like you know just let it breathe and you know that that cowboy shot hold that a lot yeah. Don't overcut. That's the most important shot for stand up in those specials. Yeah, is the I don't know who couched it. Was it Steve Allen? I mean, it just became the classic shot to give a monologue. Yeah. On well, a talk you show. Ha- the audience has to feel comfortable. Yeah. They have to be comfortable with you and with them. Mm-hmm. And, and, and if they're, and I always tell the movies, it's like, you know, and I tell this then because I was just working with a great crew in Mexico. And I said, listen, <laughs> I said, here's the thing. And I would tell the, the, the first AD, and, I, and I, you know, because we were getting along in days. And I said, you know what people never say? I got to go see that new movie. I heard it was on time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got it. Yeah. And I tell the cinematographer who wanted to do this shot. And, he said, and I said, I said, you know what they never hear? You never hear an audience, the people say, like, I got to go see that new movie. I hear the camera moves are excellent. I heard it came in <laughs> under budget. All right, Rob, thanks for coming by. I guess I that's loved it. it. Rob, we Rob do it again. Schneider, all time great on SNL, Thank huge uh, cultural influence in American comedy. Fake uh, movies in the last 30 day, years, and uh, just uh, so really shared a lot of great times with this young man. David, we're friends, right? Yeah. <laughs> I like all my youngsters. I'm so proud of both of you. <laughs> Thank you. We, all right. we hope senior. he made you proud. All right, Rob. Thanks, Robert. Peace okay, out. Be well. This has been a podcast presentation of Cadence 13. Please listen, then rate, review, and follow all episodes. Available now for free wherever you get your podcast. No joke, folks. Fly on the Wall has been a presentation of Cadence 13. Executive produced by Dana Carvey and David Spade, Chris Corcoran of Cadence 13, and Charlie Finan of Brillstein Entertainment. The show's lead producer is Greg Holtzman with production and engineering support from Serena Regan and Chris Basil of Cadence 13. 